Well, I want to be very clear. We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. That is the judgment of our Nuclear Regulatory Commission and many other experts. Furthermore, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and public health experts do not recommend that people in the United States take precautionary measures beyond staying informed. And going forward, we will continue to keep the American people fully updated because I believe that you must know what I know as president. All right, welcome to the broadcast. And we're just going to break right in with that classic piece of, I'm telling you, that's going to be classic, folks. About 10 years from now when everyone's all lit up from cancer, staggered around all over the place, hospitals are filled up with cancer victims, cancer, cancer, cancer. They're going to be playing that probably over the speakers in the weight room, I imagine, when they're going to get their chemo. You're going to, I would loop that if it were me, and I would loop it in the, uh, uh, the waiting room for the chemo, and they would have to hear that over and over and over again. So anyway, I'm going to play that and continue to play that. I think maybe from here on out, every single show, I'm going to play that. I'm going to play that to remind people that somewhere between reality, okay, and what the government tells you, there is a disconnect of that chasm. You know, it's kind of like what's the one on uh, Mars? There's that canyon on Mars that's like 20, 50 miles deep or something. That's what it's like. It's that big of a... Now, Labby, hey, seriously. And he's getting his claws stuck all in it, too. Come on, you know... For some reason, every night about this time, my cat starts digging into this empty speaker box I got with books in it and dragging everything out, Lavi. It's this weird, strange thing he's got. He'll need to empty packages and speaker boxes out. I don't know. Okay. Last time, we left off on uh, White House tasking, determine the worst-case scenario and associated plume and those consequences. I'm showing you the White House heavily involved in giving orders, the task, determine the worst case scenario, and plume model and dose consequences. You can't say they weren't really looking into it. Again, the numbers always downplayed, and they always look for iodine. We're going to talk about a couple other elements tonight, too. Not that I know a lot about them. I am a layman, but learn as we go along. It's a learning process for everyone. You don't have a choice because we're in a nuclear crisis. There's no doubt about it. Now, they won't say that on mainstream, and most of alternative won't say it, but let's face the facts. You know, it's three core meltdown, and spin fuel pool four was dry for quite some time. Days and days and days and days. Who knows? Okay, the next screen capture. The following is a synopsis of the briefing with changes or noteworthy items underlined. Status of Fukushima Daiichi units. Okay, again, I point to unit three. But that's it, Labby. Why don't you just lay down there and quit rustling around? Good kitty cat. If necessary, my wife's already been given instructions that Operation Kitty Cat Lockdown is to go into immediate effect if I call it out. If I give the command signal, he's looking at me right now and just blink at me. <laughs> okay, Unit 3, no significant change. New photos of Unit 3 from west to east provided to in country in-country team by TEPCO show massive structural and system damage to multiple levels of the reactor building. This is Unit 3 again with the mock fuel and mix oxide fuel with the plutonium in it and very deadly substance. The photos are being analyzed by the team and General Electric to determine potential for extreme spent fuel pool damage and whether or not the dry well head is intact. And what we know now is that that pool was dry for quite some time. I'm talking days, maybe weeks. I've really got to dig in and find exactly how long before they report they have some kind of level of, of, of fluid, be it seawater or whatever, covering the rods. But I know it's a significant amount of time. And, and once those rods are not covered, well, they immediately begin to produce radiation. Keep that in mind. So the next one, uh, let's see, I guess I just... Screen caption from there on down. Now, this may be something different. It says, General Electric to determine potential for extreme spin fuel pool damage and whether or not the drywall head is intact. Chairman on conference call this evening with naval reactors and INPO. Purpose of call unknown. Water sprays to Unit 3 having little or no impact. Okay, that's why I went and got this beneath uh, screen capture here. So again, it's showing that there's spring water on Unit 3, but little or no impact. Good luck with that. AMS flyovers have most deposition now north and west of the plant with a narrow band where 
15 miles from the site, the four-day integrated dose to a member of the public would be one rem. The 50-mile evacuation was a good call. Again, that's why everyone was concerned because Jacksco has a 50-mile evacuation, and my understanding is that previously 10 miles was the, the limit. In this case, he said go to 50 miles because they knew, he knew right off the bat, they all know what happens in these instances, and probably just looking at those first pictures was all they needed to see for those cats to know exactly what had happened at Fukushima. NARAC, remember NARAC does the modeling just like Ditra. NARAC has some calculations that may should meaningful, again, very poor English here, guys. Who is writing this stuff? This is horrible. Don Jackson? Dude, you need to get back to some English classes, sir. NARAC has some calculations that might be meaningful or should be meaningful. Iodine-131 uptake is possible in the Aleutian Islands, more work being done. San Onofre and Diablo Canyon may have detected small amounts of iodine-131 being confirmed. Large press contingent has confirmed plans to be at Monday Commission meeting. Okay, next screen captures email from Bill Dedman to a number of people, including the Office of Public Affairs resource at nrc.gov. Good morning. My name is Bill Dedman. I'm a reporter. Okay, this is an MSNBC article. I need to look at my note title down at the bottom of the screen captures. This is in regards to an MSNBC article. That they, the, the, the author of the article was approaching NRC to say, hey, I'm going to be writing an article. I wanted if you know if you agree with what I'm saying here, if you could give me a little information as well. And they're like really, you know, kind of freaking out over it a little bit, like, like a very... Uh, what's the word for it, obsessive about what's being written about them. And I know you can search by NRC and they can have it send them stuff every day, but they pay millions of dollars over the years, not necessarily in one year, but we've got their the, uh, the payment or whatever, the, what was like a work order or something to these MAR and these particular companies that do searching the social media for them. So this is just another example, again, uh, when it's a cover-up, you want to know who's writing what, and you want to address it, you want to restrict it, you want to influence it, you want to try to stop it even, you know. Let's say you're a reporter at MSNBC and you're a young guy on the block, you don't know better. You're writing up your nice story on earthquake codes up over here at the plants in the U.S. after Fukushima, and that doesn't go well. You're foolish enough to write the NRC asking questions. Well, maybe, then this is theoretical here, maybe they know someone that know someone, they give a call, and your boss calls you in, and he says, hey, you need to cut that out. I will need you to work on this instead. Just put that to the side. And that is how it goes in fascism. You don't necessarily have to be in on it for your boss to call you in and say, hey, stop that. I need you to get you on this. Okay, that's a good example right there. So good morning. My name is Bill Dedman. I'm a reporter for NBC News and MSNBC.com, writing an article today about safety slash risk assessment results for generic issue 199, quote, implications of updated probabilistic seismic hazard estimates in central and eastern United States on existing plants. That is a safety risk assessment. Implications of probabilistic, the chance or probability, seismic hazard for an earthquake, a seismic hazard, and that's the estimate of that in central and eastern United States on existing plants. That's what is article is going to be about, and that's, you know, obviously right after Fukushima, anyone paying attention at all, okay, unless you're completely involved in football and beer drinking and merrymaking, you're going to be very concerned about our plants here in the United States. And indeed, it's a crisis. They all got to be shut down and systematically uh, put to rest, but that's not happening right now. That's why we're going over these documents. Again, this guy, that's what he's writing about, though, is in pertaining to the chances of plants over here having an earthquake, because obviously people were inquiring about that. The public was inquiring about that. He continues to write, I reached out to NRC Public Affairs yesterday, but have not heard back. And my deadline is end of day today. Let me just say this, and, and again, this is hypothetical. Although this disinformation tactic is known and is used quite frequently, and I'm not going to start getting into all that mess with alternative media that particular people use this. But what they do is, if you ask them to do something, and they may even say, hey, send me this or contact me or whatever, and, and we'll help you out. But then you don't hear back from them, and they just sit there and, and let you wait. 
Okay, that is a tactic. That is a tactic. They have no intention of us responding to you, at least maybe not the first time. And they're hoping you just go away in a lot of cases. So I reached out to NRC Public Affairs yesterday, but have not heard back. And my deadline is end of day today. Maybe you shouldn't have told him that, dude, when you wrote that to him, right? Who knows what the original letter, you know, when he originally contacted them, what he told them. I'm hoping to get on the phone today with someone from NRC to make sure I'm conveying this information accurately to the public. If nothing else, I'm hoping one of the technical people can help clarify the points below. My telephone number is so on and so forth. I've read Director Brian Sharon's memo of September 2, 2010, to Mr. Patrick Hilland, the safety risk assessment of August 2010. It's appendices A through D, NRC Information Notice 2010-18, and the fact sheet from Public Affairs from November 2010. I have these questions. So he's read that safety risk assessment, and boy, I wish I could copy of that. I need to read that as well. And he's got some questions. So, and before he writes the article, he's kind enough to approach them and, and ask, although oh, looking at it now, I, you know, and do my research and ask independent people rather than go into these. You're, you're going to get the runaround at the very best and probably, you know, press releases and talking points and, you, you know, not going to be satisfied, I'll put it that way. Question number one, I'd like to make sure that I accurately place in layman's terms the seismic hazard estimates. I need to make sure that I'm understanding the nomenclature for expressing the seismic core damage frequencies. Let's say there's an estimate expressed as 2.5 E negative 06. And he says in parentheses, I'm looking at table D2 of the safety risk assessment of August 2010. Again, there's a table. They're using some numerical figures there, and he's unfamiliar with it. He just wants to make sure when he writes his article, he's going to be accurate. Hey, that makes sense. And you know what? You don't see a lot of numbers in my articles unless it's I'm just copying from someone else and repeating what they're saying, because unless I'm an expert, I'm not willing to go there. Because that's a quick way to look like a fool. Now, I'm sure I've been wrong in a couple places in, in, in speaking about nuclear power. I've no doubt of that. But I think more often than not, I'm on the, on the overall, I'm, I'm fairly accurate in what I'm getting across to you here. And so I stay away from some of these expressions and what have you until I'm intimately familiar with them, and then I'll, I'll elaborate more. So it says, I believe that this expression means the same as 2.5 times 10 to the power of 6, or... 0.000025, or 2.5 divided by 1 million. This is some kind of probability estimate is, is what we're talking about here. And again, when you look at these probability estimates, I should quickly speak to this. I'm not an expert either, but the, my friend who is kind of an expert is telling me that when they go in and do these earthquake analysis, there's it's not entirely accurate. Let me phrase it that way. And, and clearly, if you look at the nuclear industry, this seems to be a problem over time, and all their safety, uh, again, I've been over the safety culture and all that stuff, and they can fudge the numbers, they can do anything they want. It's kind of, it's just, you get, got to understand the numbers on their side, you have to be skeptical of them. You want an independent source that is not funded by the establishment who has nothing to gain. Again, that's why I don't accept any kind of money, I don't advertise, I don't do any of that. That way I'm totally free and clear to be 100% honest. I'm not, I have nothing to gain nor to lose from it. Hopefully I'm just totally left alone to do what I need to do here. So he's questioning some of the uh, expressions. He says, I believe that this expression means the same as, it goes to the 2.5 divided by 1 million, which is a kind of probability estimate. In layman's terms, that means an expectation on average of 2.5 events every million years. Or once every 400,000 years. Similarly, 2.5e to the power of negative 5 would be 2.5 divided by 100,000, or 2.5 events every 100,000 years on average, or once every 40,000 years. Correct. So clearly from this, whatever he's reading from, this memo, safety risk assessment, if you look at some of these figures in here, it gets down to, what, once every 40,000 years. Well, just how long has nuclear power been around for? And, and that's all that I'm saying. I mean, that's all that I'm saying. Again, obviously their estimates are completely just throw them out the door. Because how long has nuclear power been around for? How many incidences have we had with earthquakes that resulted in damage at nuclear power? And now that's resulted in catastrophic incidents. So I rest my case. If those are their numbers, even if you go with the once every 40,000 years, and again, I'm not familiar with that particular document, 
but it certainly seems that what they're going to do is give you these wonderful, nice, happy figures that are warm and fuzzy. And that's what you want to believe. That's what the American public wants to believe. Goes on question number two. These documents give updated probabilistic seismic hazard estimates for existing nuclear power plants in the central and eastern U.S. What document has the latest seismic hazard estimates, probabilistic or not, for existing, existing nuclear power plants in the western U.S.? He wants to get a document, too, that would cover the western U.S. Question number three. The documents refer to newer data on the way. Have NRC, USGS, United States Geological Service, and others at all, and others released those? I'm referring to this, quote, new consensus seismic hazard estimates will become available in late 2010 or early 2011. These are a product of a joint NRC, U.S. Department of Energy, U.S. Geological Survey, and Electric Power Research Institute project. These consensus seismic hazard estimates will supersede the existing EPRI, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and U.S hazard estimates used in the GI-199 <clears throat> safety risk assessment. Excuse me. So this guy's asking questions, and he's not only asking questions, he's saying, hey, there's this document I hear about that you said was on the way and it's going to be released in early 2011. Where is it? Where is this document? Well, how can I get a hold of it? And that's interesting because I'm reading in a 76-page document now referring to the um, testing that occurred at the Hitchwood Arsenal back in the 50s and 60s, and that's the way it that's the way it was there. When they're asking for documents, you're good at getting them. They say they're going to, in in this particular lawsuit, the Defense Department says they're going to release them and they're working on it and bagging their feet. And, and good luck. And in this case, once these, these victims, they're old guys now, back in the 50s and 60s, they're like 20 years old, 17, when they're young, 17. And so they're, they're going to die off before they drag their feet long. Same kind of thing here. Where is this new document? Why is it not readily available to the public? hey, we're talking about nuclear power. Don't, do, you, do they not take it seriously? Because we do. A guy with MSNBC, Bill Dedman, takes it seriously. And again, these are the questions they, they don't want to hear. And when they do, they all come together and say, how, handle, how are we going to approach this? Again, this is total informational control. You just be forthright, open, and honest. Again, if nuclear power is all safe and clean and wonderful, as we're told, you just be upfront and brutally honest about everything. And instead, it's been total lies and deceit ever since that day, not just TEPCO. Of course, they were going to lie, too. Right? They can't be honest with their people. You'll see stuff in here that says later in one of these that uh, if it had been under certain circumstances, they wouldn't have been able to get all of our military out of Japan in time before they would have got dosed. They'll, that'll say that in here as well. And maybe it was that bad, okay? But they're not honest in all these documents because they're well aware for you. They know all about it. They can't get around it, as we'll see tonight. They want to, but they can't. It's the best thing we got going for us, even with the redaction. Okay, next is a couple emails here from Manoli Kamal, K-A-M-A-L, to a number of people. Beasley, Benjamin, and Vernal Scott, I see in a couple of these emails here. They're familiar names. It says, uh, forward, NBC deadline question for NRC on seismic hazard estimates. So now the guy's written in. He's got some questions. Now they're starting to talk about it amongst themselves. It says, it seems that he spun the information provided to support a biased point of view he has, all, he has already and to make the story sensational. Bill, uh, from Bill Dedman to a number of people, Manoli Kamal as well, and, and Bill sending him a thing saying, hey, it's sorry, this was, okay, I'm reading it backwards. The first one, Bill sending him, the story's online now. If you see any error, please let me know right away. Again, and get back to him in a timely manner. He's got a deadline. He's got to get the article up. People are interested. They want to know what the heck's going on. We're not all experts. Maybe Bill Dedman's not an expert, but he's doing the best he can considering the fact that the NRC, DOE, and other agencies are simply not forthright. This is almost occult, the nuclear power industry. I tell you that because you have to go to school for many years to learn it. Okay, who goes to school? Well, people with money go to school. How many people go into nuclear power? I don't know. There seems to be a very refined science and a particular science that you specialize in. So many of us, and again, if you look at our school system in America, it seems to be that right now they want you compartmentalized. They want you to specialize. A mom and I were talking about this the other day. There used to be requirements, she said, when you went into school. There were certain 
group of core curriculum, you have to take the fundamental basics that taught you the, the basics you need before you can go on to acquire even greater knowledge and power. You don't want them leaving school having incredible knowledge, which equals power, but then not having the fundamentals to use that knowledge and that power wisely. Okay, and that's one thing to consider. So we are doing the best we can, all things considered. Now we're all getting a crash course in nuclear physics and, and power plant meltdowns. Let's put it that way. So there's the stories online on, hey, you screwed around long enough. I had to put it up online. You can answer those questions in a moment. you got how many specials? I don't care about a meltdown. The public has a right to know, and you have a certain group of people allotted to respond to the public. And if you don't have enough people to respond to even a foreign meltdown, well, what's going to happen when we have one over here? Good question. Okay, so then the guy responds to he's spun information, a biased point of view. Well, it looked pretty like a rational article to me, and good questions he asked. He just wanted answers to make the story sensational. And, you know, when I read this earlier today before the broadcast tonight, I saw that to make the story sensational, you know, I thought about the triple core meltdown. I thought about spent fuel pool four being dry water for a couple of weeks, maybe longer. Okay, I thought about the Unit 3, which is a catastrophic that uh, he says he believes it was a criticality, not a hydrogen explosion. It might have been something more than a hydrogen explosion that happened there. I'm not super up-to-date and familiar with that, but I have read that. I've got a link to that. I'll look back into that. But sensational? Well, hey, I don't know. You tell me, is that, is that sensational what happened over there? Would that be considered sensational, a sensation, triple core meltdown, Unit 3 exploding? Fuel, fuel number four, fuel pool number four, dry. That's pretty sensational to me. So who are these guys? I mean, who is this Manoli? Because, dude, you're going to need to get grounded in reality. Yeah, it's pretty freaking sensational what happened. And if you look at the death toll and the body count, not to get off the track here, but we need to address this little immorality here, right? Because a life, to me, a single life is very important. I don't like seeing an animal dead on the side of the road, to be quite honest with you. It makes me hate the highway system, the individual transportation, and the fact that the government won't allow us to have a, a, a train transport and a better public transport because there was a conspiracy proven back in the day where the railroads got taken down and automobile came to be prominent. This is a known fact. Okay, and all this is because of this monopoly of power. But all these are symptoms of nuclear power, too. We're a nightmare right now. And guess what? They're not making any move to shut these plants down. Zero. 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 Next email from Burnell Scott to Manoli Kamal, the guy I was just talking about, Beasley Benjamin and others. Subject, NBC deadline question for NRC on seismic hazard estimates. It's very probably so in response to his uh, saying that he was biased and, and sensational. Very probably so. We can only provide factual corrections. We need to point to specific documents whenever possible to avoid a that's just your opinion sort of response. So if we don't like what he's writing, hey, we're going to have to give some factual corrections. We can't just tell him, no, that's not right, then you can't do that. And, and, and let me just say this as well. When it says we need to uh, point to documents or, or you know, links, et cetera, again, if you print the money, okay, if you have to print the money and you're all working together, you have money to uh, buy scientists who have websites, to produce documents, to, to basically lend you credibility, but they're, they're, they're hired guns, if you will. They're, they're in scientific hired guns for a price. This is going on all over the place right now because he was talking about the ongoing climate military modification pro program for the last 30, 40 years that we're finding documents and everything about. No one. Who's was talking about Hurricane Sandy being engineered and directed into the coast? No one. No one. So, again, if you have the money, you control the outlets and you control the scientists. So they say, well, go to this document, look at this, look at that. I say, well, whose document is that and who owns that company? Who owns National Energy Institute? Who do they work with? Who are their cohorts? Right? Who do they associate with? And then when you find that out, you're like, oh, ooh, not good. It's like find your best friend hangs out with Charles Manson on the weekends, right? Like, nah, it's not good. Maybe I don't want to hang out with him or trust him or put all my faith in him anymore. Okay, next email. Burnell Scott to Beasley Benjamin and a number of others. Again, in regards to the uh, Mr. Dudman's report. And waiting for technical critique. May hand this off to other OPA, Office of Public Affairs, once I see it. Thanks. 
And then Beasley responds and says, we are checking the numbers. If you are working on a review on checking it, please let me know. I will coordinate our efforts to prevent duplication and assure we cover all the bases. Then from Lore Steven to all these guys, including Manoli, Kamal, Benjamin, Beasley, Burnell, Scott, in regard to the article, I've not looked at the article, but we recommend that you get OPA involved at once and not talk to this reporter without OPA involvement. Note the timing of this article without seismic risk vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese experience in Fukushima. Excuse me. About to sneeze there. Vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese experience at Fukushima Daiichi and also our op center email saying we will not provide information on the Japanese event. While GI-199, again, that's a safety, safety risk assessment for uh, plant over, or plants over here. I'm not exactly sure which one or once, but we know that's a safety risk assessment for American plant, if the GI-199 is not the Japanese event, we should tread carefully. So again, here, they're like, hey, you get OPA involved at once and don't talk to this reporter. Again, not anyone can just start talking. It's very careful control of who's allowed to speak and what they're allowed to say, very simply. Now, what you'd expect in a democracy and a free country, you know, in my opinion, anyway. Okay, next email still in regards to the MSNBC article. It says, of course, Scott Burnell has been involved. We are only talking to him, not any reporters. So lamps are down and know what they're doing. Okay, here's another one, um, I believe, unrelated to that. This is a new screen capture. And this is from some kind of OSTO5 hot committee or whatever to McIntyre David. And it says, briefing sheet, subject, Dave and PMT, Protective Measures Team. We received this attached briefing sheet we believe came from a plant and are being asked if this can be shared with DOE, EPA, and CA. I'm taking CA to mean California as a state. Would like your guidance on this. Parentheses appears to be sampling data from the state. So some power plants detected something, and he's saying, is this okay to share with these particular entities, DOE, EPA, and CA, California? I'm assuming that's California. I may be mistaken on that, but that's what I would suspect. The response is, Rich, please see the attached. I would like to pass to DOE, EPA, and the state, but don't know what restrictions have been placed on it. He's writing now. He's writing. This is from Bill Meyer to, again, a couple of groups. Those hawks, I guess, are groups of people or some kind of um, grouping of people. And he's basically kind of saying the same thing in this particular clip here. He's wanting to know also, I'll wait, I'll wait for your okay. Again, you see a chain of command. You see a lot of people, they're not stupid. They're careful when they say, hey, I'll wait to hear back from you. Plus, they don't want to put their butt in a sling and get in trouble with their superiors. Some of this, when you think about it, I mean, in the Army, you have a superior. You don't want to piss your superior off. We see this in the culture in NRC and a lot of these acronym agencies. It's this particular culture where you just do what you're told. A good soldier does what he's told, right, and doesn't ask questions. From Howell Art to Vegel Anton, subject briefing sheet doc, says, Tony, please ensure this get passed to the headquarter liaison team. We might want to check songs, too, and songs is a plant over here. And then there's got another uh, email here in regards to Info Diablo sent. I, I clipped this because this reference to two plants over here, and any time they're talking about information from a plant, rooftop grabs, any kind of analysis or detection data, I want to know about it and be able to at least say, look, we know they were detecting stuff over here. They can't deny that something came over here. What's in question now is, is what particular elements came over and what levels we received and what damage our population suffered and our crops and our fields in our environment. That's what we want to know about. We, and again, I will go over some of these studies like Sherman Mangano and the bird study, and we'll look at cost and consequence of Chernobyl for as long as we can until our hair starts falling out or we start glowing in the dark. Okay, the next screen capture. And this is, I have these titled, Don't Share with the State, because in the end, what you see is they didn't really want to give our states, individual states with nuclear plants, they're not very free with information that they've garnered from what happened at Fukushima. They weren't free with it with the Chinese government. They weren't free with it with international stakeholders. And this is very worrisome because these are the people, it's like you buy a car from, let's say, Chevrolet, Corvair would be a good example, the old Corvair, and you buy and you find out that there's a problem with it, but they don't want to announce that problem 
because all of a sudden people are worried. Maybe they don't want to buy any more of your cars. You got their word to drive them or operate them. It's very similar. Any kind of product you could use this analogy with it that has a defect with it. And, you know, once they find out, they don't. And watch that movie Fight Club where he talks on the plane about working for the insurance company. Many of you will know the clip I'm talking about, how they decide whether to issue a recall for the car that has a, a defect or, or whether to just go ahead and let people uh, sue them because it's cheaper to just pay off the lawsuits. Who cares if people die in the accident, right? Protective measures team, will you share this with EPA and or shall we have our federal liaison here and liaison team share with EPA? If latter, can you please do a quick summary of what is contained in this report as an intro for EPA? It's from Richard Turtle, T-U-R-T-I-L. Hmm, interesting name, Turtle. The response goes also to McIntyre David from Hawk PMP Protective Measures Team. Maybe that's like a committee with a protective measures team. It says, we caution the use of this data because it is difficult to tell if it is normal activities or a result of Japan. We can share the federal family, DOE EPA. We in our C should coordinate with EPA and suggest they have the lead to coordinate this with the state. And we recommend that at this time we don't share with the state. And again, I'm very skeptical when they say that their analysis it was below normal detectable levels, below background radiation. It just flies in the face of all, it's like a smack in the face when you read that. Honestly, once you study about Chernobyl, really study Chernobyl, and don't read from the establishment source. Just go and look independent ones and, and, and dig around, look around. Multi, you, you have to look at some of theirs, too. I'll give you that. So you can compare it to the other ones based in reality that aren't heavily funded and controlled by the establishment. And then you'll begin to understand that IAEA and some of these, the WHO, they're, they're not... To say they're not very realistic, well, I'm being really nice. It's blatantly, obviously, fudged, flawed, controlled, managed numbers. It just doesn't make any sense once you really study. And then you hear, oh, it's below background. Hey, that flies also in the face of every uh, individual uh, independent test we've had since then, the Bird study, the Madonna sherman study, the Bobby 1, the Fatality Index studies are very, very telling because they match up with the ones that were done right after Chernobyl. And that matches up with the bird study as well. I've got all links to these on Uncovering Plumegate. <laughs> Thanks to Donna for helping from 12 Truthers. We've got a great little uh, uh, blog going there, and you guys can dig into it. We've got links and everything there. So look at the bird study and read Alec Baldwin's letter. We have that there as well in regards to the Tooth Fairy Project. So clearly in this clip we just looked at, are they free with information to the states? No. Okay, next screen capture is an email from Powers Dana to Kelly John. It says, in regards, I thought this one was really interesting. I've never heard of this before, but it made a lot of sense. Subject, biological growth in the actor coolant system. And as you are aware, during the recovery at Three Mile Island, hydraulic fluid was spilled into the reactor coolant system, and bi biology began to take place. Eventually, the ecosystem that developed in the water was thick enough to interfere in the ability to see fuel for the removal process. Growth was taking place where fuel was on the order of 10,000 rims an hour contact. So yes, things can survive in near that high level of radiation. And what happened was a foreign biological substance or creature was introduced to the the fluid, and inside of the fluid, it began to grow and thrive. And then eventually got so thick, like a kind of algae maybe is a fair analogy, that you can't see the fuel rods to go in there when it comes time to work with them. Very a worrisome situation. Because so now at Fukushima, raw seawater with organisms and nutrients have been pumped into the coolant system. Pressures and temperatures in the core regions may be sufficient to sterilize the water. The same may not be the case for peripheral regions of the reactor coolant system. As recovery progresses and temperatures fall, growth may start taking place in areas critical to the continued cooling of individual fuel assemblies or otherwise interfering with the recovery process. I have no expertise in this area. I did contact Argon, that's a lab, lab laboratory. I did contact Argon because of the work they have done on microbe enhanced stress corrosion cracking. Ken Natasan or Natasan suggested some possible experts or at least people that may know experts. So 
So it's very interesting that this could be a problem. He goes on to say, another person has substantial experience as an ex-NALCO employee by the name Mike Enzian. He is currently a principal research scientist at the Dow Chemical Company and is lead R&D research and development specialist at Dow Microbial Control, Dow Chemicals. Interesting, Dow Chemicals, that's one of the ones that Stratford sells the intelligence to and works with Dow Chemicals. Hmm. He has done a lot of work in this area. I suspect this is an area that is not being considered by anyone who was not involved with Three Mile Island. I might be one of those, it might be one of those nasty surprises that can bedevil recovery activities. Do you want to follow up on this? I suspect that there are people better suited than I to do this follow-up, Dana. You know, they don't want you to know this. Again, if we have a problem over here, and we've got a lot of plants near the ocean, if there's a problem with the water source, they're going to draw from the ocean, just like in Fukushima, then what are you doing? Introducing microbes into the coolant system. Then what's the problem going to be? Well, we, we've just heard about it. Later, those organisms are going to multiply and reproduce and become, uh, 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 there's nothing else, they're going to, cloudy, the water, you're not going to be able to see. And again, that changes the chemistry of the, of the coolant as well. These are very tolerances of these systems. If one tiny thing that goes wrong, you could have a catastrophic criticality. This is going to be a serious problem because what, how are they going to flush this out? How are they going to get those microbes out 100%? I'm assuming when the system's first brought to bear, they sterilize everything the water that's inserted or the coolant inserted is sterilized as well. And that way, and again, it has to be almost like hospital-like conditions, I'm sure, when they build them. They very, have to be very uh, uh, slight tolerances. There's no room for error. You can't introduce foreign. It's like working at the space shuttle at the at Kennedy here in Florida. When you're building these satellites, they wear gloves and masks and the dust. There's no dust. It's an ultimately incredibly clean environment. So introducing foreign bodies, especially from the ocean, hey, this is how Godzilla got started, right? Got a little humor there, right? Okay, next screen clip. Urgent FOIA request on Japanese event. I titled this FOIA Wine because there's a guy that's really whining in here about the FOIA. I can't do my job and get a FOIA document. Give me a break, man. Come on. I'm trying to shut these things down so those kids quit getting radiated. Ibarra Jose, or J-O-S-E, however you want to pronounce it, says, DRA staff, we have been tasked with a FOIA request from the Associated Press. I talked about this before. They Early on, the Associated Press filed, and a number of others did, and a lot of people filed and just didn't do nothing with it. Isn't that interesting that four, I could say four or five sources I can think of filed early on, and then really I can't think of any of those really going into any great detail on the documents. Well, other than maybe like informable to do some, and any news prints and stuff up, I think they just capture from other articles from around the world. So really informable, that's it, man. That's it all I can think of. There may be others. There's a couple other sites that are sketchy and shady. I won't even, I won't even mention them because sending it there is probably do more harm than good. So they're concerned about the AP sending for a FOIA request. Regarding internal communications within the NRC pertaining to the Japanese nuclear incident at Fukushima Daiichi and Fukushima Daini and on the Gawa power plants, consequence of the earthquake and tsunami events on March 11. It goes on to say, as detailed in the letter from AP, quote, the communication should include emails, faxes, and written correspondence between the commission's chairman, its four commissions, their staffs, the public affairs team, and employees of other offices such as the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, the Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response, and the NRC's 24-hour operations center. So it gives you a little idea in, into the insight into the Freedom of Information Act, kind of what they're they're suing for, what they're sending off for. And you have to pay for the each page. It's, it's not free. It's quite expensive. People were asking me, did you send off for freedom of information? No, I don't have any money. It's enough. I have to wait for these other guys with the cash, and they go send off for it. And whether they work with it or not, I don't care. I'll go and find it sooner or later and write about it. And, and my understanding is uh, NRC, this, much of this stuff is readily available anyway. So when you sue, they go in for you and grab that particular stuff and put it in a nice thing. Well, not that nice, but they do kind of collect it for you. It's not necessarily chronological. Lots redacted. Lot is duplicated, and they blizzard it all at once sometimes. But and there you have it. That's the way it goes. 
It says, please provide hard copies of any records that meet the above criteria to Jose Ibera by COB on Tuesday, March 29th. In addition, please identify those records that may contain information you believe should not be released to the public for the exemption instructions detailed in Step 6 of the attached document. Now, we'll look at that in a second. How to, the document tells how to respond to a FOIA request. There are certain rules and regulations, what you can redact and what you can't redact. Of course, again, uh, who's, who is holding accountable the redactors? Who's watching the redactors? Who watch, who's watching those watching those watching the redactors? See how that works? It's like here in Gainesville today, we had a GPD officer who fired shots into a car and shot some guy in the head. They said he, he didn't stop. He tried to run him over when he took off. So when he crashed into the thing, they shot fired shots in this thing. Well, this has happened before in this town. There's been a number of shootings by GPD. And interestingly enough, when FDLE investigates, to my knowledge, it's always justified. I can't recall anyone ever saying not justified. And we had the Audu Brimpong case where the teaching assistant who was mentally ill and really needed a doctor got shot in the face with an AR-15. <laughs> so it's quite worrisome. Okay, so freedom of information re request. And they're talking about what you can and can't redact here, and we'll look at that in a second. I'm pretty sure I've got a screen capture on that coming up, or at least one, one particular aspect of that. This is urgent. FOIA request on Japanese event from Wagner Mary to Beasley Benjamin. I strongly protest to this. This is Wagner Mary. Okay, this is a woman here, and I hear a lot of men bitching too, but here's a woman who's griping and complaining about the most beautiful thing in the world for well, other than the Q-tip. I think the Q-tip is possibly the world's most perfect event. If you made them out of hemp and they were biodegradable, they would be. They really would be. You can't live without Q-tips, though. You really can't. I strongly protest to this request if it means that the communications I have with you, with other RES personnel, and with clearinghouse personnel are subject to Freedom of Information Acts. If our private communications cannot be kept private, we cannot function. Well, what does that mean? We cannot function. Wow, we can't. Hmm. I'll leave you to decide what that means. We cannot function. Beasley Benjamin returns, uh, and I, I, actually, I'm re again, some of these, like I just said, they don't make it easy for you. They put it in backwards order. You could uh, again, they're transcribing these in chronological. The tapes are playing from front to back, right? It's not like some Christian, crazy Christian 501c3 playing a Led Zeppelin record backwards, right? and trying to write the words. The tape plays from the beginning to the end. So as they transcribe it, it should be in that order. But when you look at them, sometimes you've got to go to the last page of the document and start looking forward, or at least to a, a page further down the line, and then read backwards if you want to read it in that chronological order. So I apologize for that, but that's when these things are set up. And to screen capture each individual one and go through all that, it's, I don't have that kind of time. So please cut me some slack. The original email was from Beasley Benjamin to a number of people about the FOIA request, and he says, because I'm curious, please let me know roughly how much time you spend responding to this request. And he's probably trying to get an idea. I know they're balancing their numbers. They don't have millions of personnel. I understand they're shorthanded, and they're shorthanded now. But again, that seems to be a problem. If your industry is shorthanded, constantly shorthanded, you, can't, you don't have the manpower to respond to an incident far, far, far away. What am I to think about when something happens over here? Where is the manpower at? Do we need to do some hiring? Maybe should we invade less countries and put more money into protecting our nuclear plants? Do you think the national security issue? Really, I have to, after three uh, meltdowns, three miles, they can say it's a partial, that's Chernobyl, pretty serious. And then this one, wow. Okay, just wow. I wish I had a bunker because I'd feel a heck of a lot better. I'd, I'd have a bunker, bunker broadcast myself, and I'd broadcast from a mile deep. So this person is whining about the FOIA. They cannot function without it. And I'll leave you to decide what that means. From Beasley Benjamin to Wegner Katsha. Unfortunately, protesting will not do any good. We are required to provide the request information. Yeah, it's like a law. It's like a law. I mean, we made some laws. This is incredible. These people, like, when you hired them, did you not explain this to them? I mean, some of them know about the freedom of information. Maybe this is just a noob. You know, they call it noobs, N-O-O-B. The new guy, the green guy, doesn't have any clue what's going on. Protesting won't do any good. We're required to provide the request and information unless it meets on of the exemption one of the exemption criteria. Okay, let's see if I've got that in here. Somewhere, I, I know I've got a clip from one of the aspects of the criteria that we can redact. 
The next one, from sealing Donna to a number of people, some of them, most of them I'm not super familiar with. Subject, expediting processing for requests for you. Good morning, all. We have received three FOIA requests from the AP for information related to the event in Japan. The requests are FOIA 2011. I'm going to give the number of the documents. These requests have been granted expedited processing. This means that they go to the head of the line and must be processed before any other FOIA request you may already have. You are receiving this email because your office has been assigned one or more of these expedited requests. While I recognize you may have many competing in these serious and dynamic times, yeah, I would appreciate your timely response to these requests. Next clip. Carteris Tom to Valentine Andrea, expediting processing for requests. Says Andrea, I contacted the FOIA office and spoke with Mary Jean Raphael and J A Z L, whoever that is, Jazel, Giselle, via teleconference. I explained the concern we had about meeting the timeliness requirements. FOIA response provided in 10 days, and 90% of the requests received in a given month meet the timeliness requirement, it says in parentheses. So it's about meeting the timeliness requirement while continuing to work in a crisis mode and our desire to get it stopped. Mary Jean explained that the timeliness requirement can't be stopped, or desire to get it stopped. They're talking about to get the FOIA. They, again, this is back to the whole thing. They're trying here in this series of emails they're inquiring, can we just get the FOIA thing stopped for Japan? Do you think it could just turn it off, kind of like that internet internet switch for Obama? Do you think Obama could turn off the FOIA switch? I mean, folks, I think he's got a FOIA switch. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just funny for me. He's got an internet switch and a dang FOIA switch under his desk. It's probably like a little toggle switch like you buy down at the at the discount auto parts, auto zone. So he could put a couple toggle switches under that White House desk in the main room, one to the internet, the yeah, others to the freedom of information. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. So that's what this is about. They're asking, can we get it turned off? He says, because this specific FOIA request was granted expedited processing, it must take priority over all other non-expedited FOIA requests currently handled within RES. That includes the SOARCA, so ARCA request too, since it is considered a non-expedited item. During the discussion, there was no agreement reached to stop the timeliness requirement. I was provided a copy of the attached email and told to do the best we can in responding to the request. Well, I mean, in all fairness, if if there are more serious things to handle because of a meltdown and trying, to, if they're honestly really trying to do something, I would say, hey, you know, if you got to pull guys off of this, the FOIA request probably at this point in time, you know, we wanted as soon as possible, but we want to mitigate the the, uh, the the circumstances of Fukushima, first and foremost, and take care of the American public. That I would agree with. But again, they didn't do that. So you might as well go ahead and get the FOIA request done and get it out to us, right? So they're doing their best to, to try. They either want to slow it down and say, look, we might not be able to meet this deadline, just to summarize this, and we'll go to the next one. Might not be able to meet this deadline. Hey, is it possible that you just, you know, not, can we turn this off? Can you call Obama? and have him flick that switch under his desk and turn the FOIA off. Gibson Cassie writing to Valentine Andrea. And make sure I do these in the right order because they back them up. And then they have military time, 132557. That's not helping me either. And I'll just read from the top one. It says, regardless of what the outcome of our pushback is, I anticipate that DSA will not meet the time in this goal. I do not intend to pull people off event response to work on a FOIA request, unless directed by B slash J or somebody higher. Even if we take the people working on the SOARCA Freedom of Information Act and put them on the Japan Freedom of Information Act, hmm, i got to look at that SOARCA stuff for you. I'm not familiar with that. I'm really curious now. So if they take them off of the one and put them on the Japan, we will not meet the date. There's just too many other things going on. And I do understand in here that the NRC is, is extremely shorthanded and the whole nuclear industry seems to be, I'm being told they're, they're hiring, I'll put it that way. From Valentin Andrea to a number of people uh, in, in regards to the Freedom of Information, the expedited request. For Jennifer's request at the 845, Tom Carter asks, looking looked into trying to get the Japan FOIA turned off. Oh, God, I love Guy. Folks, I'm going to, Tom Carderas, Carderas, Tom Carderas, let me say that next time, 
Tom Carteras. Tom Carteras. Tom Carteras is looking into trying to get the Japan for you. Just turn it off. Is this, did you call Obama and ask him to flick that switch under his desk, Mr. Carteras? I mean, when I read this earlier, I said tonight I probably should go off on this guy a little bit. I, I won't. I won't. But I should take 10 minutes to expound upon what a short-sighted uh, individual this man is to just turn it off. Imagine how they just turned off. Just turn off the recorder, stop everything. We're not. We're just going to blank Fukushima and just we're nothing. N nothing's getting out. We're recording it. Not even stuff to redact. Not even a whole page to redact chapter. The guy. And then I said to Ambassador DeRuth and the page, "You're going to get that. You're going to get that." Thanks to Tom Cardras, had he had his way, trying to get the Japan for you turned off. No freedom of information, according to Tom. Cardraft, you, you don't need it. We don't want it. It's a hassle. It's a pain in the butt. It's trouble. It's inconvenience. Right? Is it, can we just turn it off? Call OB. Have him put that switch under his desk, you know? It's insane. Based on the highlighted portions of Tom's summary below, we need senior level intervention to get this turned off. <laughs> Since the FOIA office accepted it as an expedited request. Well, the FOIA office, thank you very much, is doing its job, fool. They're telling you, no, you really got it the law. You kind of like, I have to do it. That's why we made the laws. It's like the law against murder. If we just make an exception for some, we got to make an exception for everybody. And let me tell you something, folks. One night I'm going to do a thing on freedom of information because right here in Gainesville, the Marion Bretner Freedom of Information Center conveniently in the crash, in the plunge, in the, oh, they, they call it nice names, but it's really a collapse, all but that we're going through. The, the financial fund for this uh, plummeted precipitously on the stock market. They don't have money anymore, so it's been downsized, and they don't, they don't produce the same students out of there that are, that are masters of the freedom of information to go on and teach at other schools and teach people about freedom of information. That's what the center was all about, right? And now my wife used to work there. That's how I kind of know about this. Now it's downsized, and instead of what it used to be, it's like a skeleton crew of one guy working in a room. It's not what it was. They used to have this. A Bill Chamberlain guy worked there and taught us. Uh, many students. He was, trust me, this guy. I got a lot of books from him. He retired, and we offered every. He offered me. He said, "You want this book?" Yeah, I think that. Yeah. They were all good, like Andrew Kenan Rollins, case, Kobe Bryant, uh, Trial by the Media, a bunch of interesting uh, books. So, freedom of information. It's so critical. I must tell you this. Uh, we'll have to pack the streets and do whatever it takes if they ever try to shut freedom of information down. And I don't appreciate it. I understand Obama's tampering with it now. Right, this is part for the course. It didn't surprise me when I heard that. So can we get it turned off? Can we just get it turned off, Tom Cardras? Thanks so much, sir. But they're not going to do it. It's law. And they may make an exception if you're truly that busy and, and you get out as soon as you can. But, you, you know, that's the critical thing about it. Information must be distributed accurately and in a timely manner to the American public. For if it is not, why are we paying taxes? Why are we being blasted by plumes and BP oil spills? Go to resonated 3D climate viewer and look at that little map of his on there where all the uh, nuclear sites are in America and the Superfund sites and the spilled substances and the, and the waste dumps and everything, it, it, it will blow your mind. You will then realize we are in criticality right now in so many aspects, not just nuclear, but all of the, the environment. i got a super fun site right here in Gainesville. It's beautiful, where they make creatures of the bottom and all sorts. And there, there's rumored there's barrels buried there, barrels of stuff buried. And, and Hogtown Creek is so, well, it's beautiful, but the thing is, you can't, oh, i got a frog in my house. I'll be darned. You guys are just going to have to give me a second. I've got an actual little green tree frog in my house right now. I've got him before my cat got him. <laughs> Can't believe that. It's rained here heavily, I mean heavily the last couple of days. Let me wash my hands, guys. I was kind of cold and clammy. You pick up. This is real, folks. When you get a broadcast from me, you get the real deal. Cat, frog, you know, better than spiders. Look at that. Got to get the cold, clammy frog off me there. Okay. Now, back to nuclear reality. Next screen capture from Somerville Mark to Carson Lewis, briefing sheet. Lewis, here's what I circulate inside the plant. Now, I'll save this one. I've got others that I've screen captured before. We says, here's what I circulate inside the plant, and here's information for you to send up the line that we now know they had a password database where they store all these rooftop grabs and samples from the nuclear power plant and 
in the last broadcast, we looked at a number of the, although again, I insist, and I, uh, my contention is they downplay it completely. Think about the centers. You've got to own a lot of people. You really do to be able to pull off this kind of dangerous operation. There's many years without the American public finding out what's really going on. I rest my case on the, just the reality of the fact that the first herd of sheep will really, if they knew what we knew, they would be very anxious right now, I'm sure of it. They would insist that their local news begin to talk about this. Okay, next screen capture. Okay, this is the briefing sheet that's coming up we're about to look at here. So this one is just forwarding the importance. High attached, this terrible grammar. Attached is attached this time. Look, attached is the briefing sheet this time is what it's saying. And now we're going to look at the briefing sheet in the next screen capture. Weather patterns is what we're looking at here. Current weather patterns predict an optimum sampling location in southern Oregon or northern California. This remains current. March 18 predictions show a slight southerly droop in the jet stream. AEA slash UN, United Nations, predict air mass emphases and, quotes, plume arrival also on March 18. We expect no detectable radioactivity. That's just, when I read that in the same sentence, to me, that, that, is, that is the classic case study example of Orwellian doublethink, to hold two opposing, contrasting uh, concepts in your mind at the same time, and being able to do that and you know, it's like the fire is cold and fire is hot, and you believe both at the same time. That's amazing to me, and just incredible. They know the plume arrival and much. They knew the date of the arrival. FEMA standing down. David Liu letter. FEMA standing down. What's FEMA for? I mean, I could go off for two hours on just the total uselessness of FEMA. Well, we know what they're really for, but what they tell you they're for, obviously not. And let me add real quickly, don't give your money to that stupid concert they got going. For the Sandy Hurricane victims, I know what people will say, oh, you shouldn't say that, oh, help the Sandy victims. Uh, ask the Haiti victims how the Red Cross and George Bush and Bill Clinton have been. Ask the Farm Aid victims uh, or, or the, the Bono concerts, would he, where did that money go? Where did the money go to help them people? Because you know what, all the years and all those concerts, I haven't seen anything come of it. And when Haiti, when, when George Bush said send cash, send blankets, food or water, supplies, send cash, and Clinton in the same in the same commercial advertisement, Red Cross and Hillary Clinton, you can text this on your cell phone, it's in $10. See how this, they intensify the hurricane, slam it into the coast, and then expect you to donate. And then not do anything about them doing this, right? And I've, I've given links for you guys to go to resonate and chemtrailsplanet.net. And seriously, this is a major problem. Also, it affects the nuclear plants. I'm not straying off course at all here, folks, because this ties right back into the Oyster Creek and the Nine Mile, all these other plants that when the, Sandy hit, man, we're not going to, how many hurricanes are we going to get by with before something happens? Do you feel lucky? You like Dirty Harry? Do you feel lucky today? Because I don't feel, not, you know what, I'm looking around at the world today, I am not feeling lucky anymore. I don't know about you, but I do not feel lucky anymore. Coastal dispersion will pull some of the air mass south to the California coast. Again, <laughs> mm. Some of this is hard for me to read because I know people actually have freaking died from this over here. Thousands and thousands of people. Now, if the radiation was purple in color, oh, I wouldn't even be here tonight. There would have been a revolution back when this thing went on. People would have hit the streets that would have never stopped. You would have seen it in the air. The xenon was freaking everywhere, according to the NILU forecast they did, which they shut down later on. So I suspect they're probably fairly accurate. Probably fairly accurate. They were pulling plume maps off the Internet as soon as they could find them. And yet they're talking about plume mass in California. Don't worry, it's undetectable limits. Well, that's not according to independent studies. And then you raise the limits, and then the RADNET monitors are, are tampered with. What, are we to, what else can we conclude? I've seen studies where the plutonium levels are 20 times what they were over here now from the Cold War era war bomb testing. 20 times or greater. So just not adding up. It's just not, when I read these sentences, it, it, it infuriates me. It really does because absolutely... What is it, based in reality? What reality? On what planet do these people spend most of their time? I begin to wonder. I actually wonder, are they off-planet somewhere? And now it's this little game here. Who is off-planet control on this planet? Right? Because I, I wouldn't operate in any of this manner at all. First of all, with me, you wouldn't have nuclear power at all. I'd say, first of all, we're going to unleash all suppressed technologies or somebody's going to jail or worse, and we'll find out who's holding them all. It's easy enough to do. Easy enough to do. It's a two-part series, and then we begin... Uh, dismantling and shutting down systematically 
these plants, it takes years to do it. Jobs will be created. Things will change. Coastal touchdown of plume prediction confirmed. Okay, they confirm it. They confirm it. So I don't know what to tell you on this, folks. They knew the plume was coming. We've seen the damage that's happened from it. We've had independent studies. If you go to E&E News, if you go to Informable, there's still a lot of good stuff on E&E News, even though during the threads and some of the threads, there's good people there, and there's trolls printing up pages of garbage trying to water it down and wreck things. Right, so we don't have any really good site right now that Patrick Penner is going to look at you and say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you go to that site because it's got it all. It's got it all. No, I can't tell you that. Really, I can't. I'm sorry to say that. Sorry. And not even me either because I'm one guy trying to crank out as much as I can without doing it too hasty that I make myself look like a fool because I'm learning as I go on a lot of this. And I'm subject to correction. If I've stated anything incorrect, please inbox me on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook and let me know. I will make a, 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 a broadcast over air and make a, a correction, a live correction to state that I was wrong. I've already did it once already with the Chuck Castro thing on the breach of containment, although I wasn't that much off, but I like to be as technically precise as possible. I don't want to misrepresent anything. Okay, next screen capture. Sample protocol, it says, continuous trending air sampler deployed for monitoring external atmosphere. Daily radioisotopic analysis of air sample filter weekly off-site radioisotopic analysis of environmental air sample filters. And basically, they're just, you know, you can see here, I thought this was interesting because you can see they, these monitors they've got. What's up with these monitors? I wish they could spare us a few over here in the States when the plume came over so we could know when we were sitting. When for people stay inside, you know, I read when it comes to fallout, if you're inside, it can cut it down to 25% to 10% of what it would have been if you were outside. I mean, I know you've got to go outside sooner or later. But just literally being outside as it's falling, raining down on you. It's, again, it's not, not like tiny grains of sand. It's not like droplets. It's invisible. Isn't that amazing? It's not the color purple. You don't see it coming across. You really don't. You might initially see the plume and cloud from the explosion and what have you, but most of the emanation is so small and tiny. It's just tiny particles, nanoparticles. Okay, the next clip I'm going to read first couple paragraphs anyway out of this to give you an idea of what was going on. This is from the briefing sheet. So the NRC indicates that three of the six reactors are likely to have experienced a significant amount of core damage. Again, this indicates early on they know all this stuff. Our government knows it all. Not that TEPCO was super honest, but you know, they're, they're all very deceptive. The amount of core damage and the extent of core cooling currently being provided are not known with any certainty. The NRC reports that Japanese officials believe that some core cooling is being provided via seawater injection. However, in our discussion with the NRC indicates the technical basis for the Japanese conclusion has not been provided. Consequently, there is significant uncertainty as to whether core conditions are stable or degrading. That kind of goes back to the one flyover with the drone where the Japanese team yeah, we see a sparkle of water down there and Chuck Castro said, no, I don't see that technical basis for their conclusion was not provided. They can't agree with them. Radiation levels on site have reportedly stabilized somewhat from a peak of 400 rem per hour, which occurred on 16 March 2011, to current levels of 40 rem per hour near Unit 4. However, it is not possible to conclude whether core damage is continuing from this data because on-site radiation levels are significantly affected by the direct radiation from the damaged reactors and fuel storage pools. It is likely, as a minimum, that periodic additional releases of radioactivity are occurring as the plants vent to atmosphere. In a more severe scenario where it is not possible to restore sufficient core cooling to the three damaged reactors, significant additional radioactivity releases will occur over time. The amount of radioactivity released is highly dependent upon whether the reactor containment structures remain intact. There is no way of predicting whether containment will be maintained. If containment is not maintained, that its laboratory estimates downwind radiation. And I clipped this one because multiple times it speaks to the venting to the atmosphere, releases of radioactivity. This is not what you would have gotten a press release. This is not what you would have gotten a talking point. And I've got so many links to press releases and talking points and Q&A, Q&A and press releases and talking points. Man. You just want the facts. And we're sick in America of having to dig this. You know, I should be recording confirmed reptilian right now, to be straight honest with you. But instead, I'm having to deal with this 
nonsense right here because some illogical, greedy uh, uh, nuclear barons, or whatever you want to call them, have forced this monopoly upon us. The Chevron and the, all these energy giants, that, that's the problem. The problem are the corporations. There's no nations anymore. That's the problem. So I can't do music like I should because now I have to really worry about you know, my nephew and niece and these other people that I love and care about, which is every good person on planet Earth is going to have to deal with radiation for how long? You know, how many more meltdowns we've got to go through? It's unacceptable to me. I'm willing to put other things to the side or maybe do just less of that and more research and, and more broadcasts and more articles and more radio shows and whatever it takes. I hope other people see the, the, the urgency and, and the seriousness of everyone coming together and putting down these you know, game, childish games people's playing right now and this entertainment and they're well, having a lot of fun. I'm sure they are, but how long? You have to ask yourself. Adding to the uncertain situation, cooling has been lost in the fuel storage pools in Units 1 through 4. NRC believes that water from the Unit 4 storage pool completely drained and a violent zirconium and water reaction occurred, resulting in a significant release of radioactivity to the atmosphere. Wow. I mean, that to me is just incredible right there because that's really not what we were told. And when they do tell us anything, well, they're checking for iodine and it's below minimum detection levels. It always is. And it always will be just like the effluence that each plant in the United States and indeed around the world, they have to allow it because you have to vent sometimes if circumstances, pressure is too high. This is simple physics. If you don't vent pressure, when pressure starts to get too high, well, something has to give. Two objects can occupy the same space at the same time, and something's going to have to give. So they all allowed it, and it's always super low, below these wonderfully safe levels. How is that? How do they guarantee that? Why has it never one been over? Is it never? But well, we find out, but we find out the hard way later. When the tritium's leaked in the ground from the pipes they weren't supposed to put down there. Bechtel's put a tank in the ground that's leaking so they could hurry it and get their $34 million bonus or whatever it was. It was a lot of money. But then in the end, who's paying for it? In the end, who's, that earth is, you know, is that going to be a sore spot in the earth for thousands and thousands of years? That's what the Indians said. We make the earth sore. That's what they said. And we do. We make the earth sore, no doubt about it. I'm going to move on to the next one. You can you can see some of these in here. And you can clearly they're talking about the unit the pool, unit four remains dry. Ongoing releases of radioactivity are expected. This is incredible. I could just write one article on this thing right here. The learning curve is going to get us all killed. We can see that now. I mean, by their learning curve, they say, well, we're going to learn from Fukushima. We're going to learn from Fukushima and this thing. This is a good thing. We're going to learn from it. Well, how many more till we learn everything? Because I don't think we can take the next, next one. We're going to get even better. And the next one after that, even a little better than that. And then a couple few more meltdowns from there, we'll have it perfectly. I don't think we're going to be able to last that long. I'm just not seeing it. I'm really not. I don't want to live in that world anyway. Next screen capture. So depending on proximity of Fukushima, prior to exceeding the general public exposure limit specified by some BUMED, I'm not sure what that is, and some kind of 0.10 rem per year, the departure time frame of a few does not account. This, these are have titled continued venting, this little series, because in there they mention a number of times that the these things vent and continue to vent. I thought that's really critical. People need to understand. When it goes down over here and a Mark I melts down, it's going to vent and continue to vent. He spray seawater on That's nice. That's something they did in the Fukushima, too. He can spray fresh water on us. But still, what's the effect going to be? What's going to be effective? Listen to this little kicker right here. Administering potassium iodide to large populations of Navy civilians, military personnel, and their dependents reinforces the need for departure. In the more extreme scenarios involving significant additional core or pool damage, which it was, there would not be sufficient time to evacuate Navy civilians, military personnel, and their dependents to avoid the higher exposure levels discussed above. We read some of that, those levels above. The departure time frame of a few days does not account for the increasing rate of exposure due to buildup of ground deposition. Current measured loose surface contamination levels at 170 miles are approximately 1,500 picocuries per 100 centimeters square over wide areas. Additional releases similar to those previously observed will cause loose surface contamination levels to double each 24 hours. High levels of loose surface contamination over such wide areas and distances create significant ingestion and inhalation hazards, which add to the dose calculated above. 
and reduce evacuation time. Additionally, for each successive release, thyroid doses will exceed levels at which potassium iodide should be administered as far out as 170 miles. So this is not, you don't hear this kind of rhetoric over here. You don't hear it mainstream. You don't hear it in NRC. They, they just don't, this is not the kind of talk we're allowed to hear. Thank goodness for freedom of information. I can hear kind of, and maybe this isn't giving us everything, but this is certainly insightful. And this is insightful as to what would happen over here. Think about what they're talking about. If it happens over here, you might not be able to administer and get people out, potassium iodine, and get people out evacuated in time to avoid higher exposure levels discussed above. Thyroid doses will exceed levels at which potassium iodide should be administered. Next clip from Ibarra Jose, for your request from Associated Press. As all as I'm headed out the door, I've just received a ticket on a FOIA. The Associated Press is requesting copies of all internal NRC communication associated with the Japanese nuclear accident. I have no time to give you a copy of the request, but will on Monday. The due date is March 30. This is a heads up. Okay, next email. Same, oh, that's the, okay. <laughs> next email says, oh, goody, something to look forward to, boss. Kuritsky Allen. Yeah, I meant to go on that number of frame 190. I wanted to take that one out because as you see in this next frame I captured, the one I just read to you at the bottom, and then the, the one that followed after that at the top, the guy's, oh, goody, something to look forward to, boss, freedom of information. He's just kidding around, but none of them, a you know, few of them probably think very highly of it. It may be more of a pain in the ass to them, if anything. The okay, next screen capture from Leeds Eric to Williams Edward. Says, Ed, RR has received a freedom of information request from the AP requesting all emails and internal communications with regard to the Japanese event. This will take each staff member hours for response at a time where we are already stretched thin to support the OP Center in Japan, etc., etc. Et Any advice on how to proceed? Is there an OGCPOC we can work with on this? Uh, other government something, point of contact. I'm not OGC. I didn't ring a bell right off the bat. Point of contact we can work with on this. Our point of contact is Sean Megan. So they're asking advice on how to proceed. We've got a FOIA request. And again, this might not really be indicative of much of anything, but they're how they handle FOIA requests, how they come in, how they allot personnel to them, what they can redact, what they can't. The whole FOIA thing in and of itself is quite interesting. Next screen capture from Williamson Edward to Leeds Eric. Hi, Eric. OGC's FOIA legal advice comes from Pat Hirsch and her OGC division. I think in particular, Kathy Holtzy is the key OGC senior attorney that works on providing advice regarding FOIA. I have CC'd both of them in the hopes that they can directly give you and your staff some timely legal advice that takes into account the current NRR focus and extensive efforts in support of Operations Center and other assistance relating to Japan. It's still early in the process, so OGC is not involved in the review end of this yet. But early today, I spoke with a FOIA Sec Chief, Donna Feeling, who mentioned that we had received three FOIA requests on Japan, and that these had asked for, quote, unquote, expedited treatment under our FOIA regulations. Under the regulations, yeah, probably if you pay a little more or something, you can request expedited uh, treatment. And then, and then it's supposed to be kind of rushed or hurried within a quicker frame of time, whereas if you just pay the minimum fee, you have to wait the longest amount of time. We rarely grant these requests for special processing, but in this case, it was considered necessary. This will certainly train on everyone who needs to provide records, but we need to do our best to comply. Your FOIA coordinator, Patty Craver, is a seasoned FOIA expert, and she will have no trouble working with the FOIA office on the response. Naturally, OGC stands ready to provide legal support as needed. Well, we know OGC provides legal support, whatever that is, as needed. But there won't be much for us to do in that respect until information is gathered and provided to the FOIA office. Please let me know if I may be of further assistance. Only agency records that are in existence on the date, okay, these are FOIA rules. Only agency records that are in existence on the date NRC received the request are subject to a FOIA request. Agency records are records created or obtained by the agency and under the agency control at the time of the request. This includes records created by the NRC staff, records submitted to the NRC by applicants, licensees, contractors, federal and state agencies, international organizations, and members of the public. 
No records that are potentially responsive to the FOIA request may be destroyed after receipt of the FOIA request. I'll read that one more time. No records that are potentially responsive to the FOIA request may be destroyed after receipt of the FOIA request. Does that mean they can be destroyed before receipt of the FOIA request? I mean, that's kind of hmm, strange there. However, there is no need to reconstruct a record that was destroyed prior to receipt of a request, nor does NRC have to inform the requester that a record does not exist since it was destroyed prior to receipt of the request. So anything prior to these FOIA requests, if they want to delete their files or send a letter out or whatever it is, hey, it sounds to me like it's fair game and they don't provide it. Once you've made that request, by law, they're not supposed to delete it or destroy it. As a matter of discretion, you may include records that can be released that were created after the date a request was received if you believe it would provide a clearer picture of the agency actions regarding the subject of the request. The agency is not obligated to create a record to respond to a request. Neither does the FOIA require an agency to answer questions that are asked in a request. They don't have to answer questions. They just send you the material. You answer the questions yourself. Brief descriptions of the FOIA exemptions are noted below. Descriptions also found and so on and so forth. Exemption 1, information properly classified pursuant to an executive order. Information properly classified pursuant to an executive order. This includes information classified as confidential national security information, secret national security information, or top secret national security information. Provide a foreseeable harm statement only if obvious. I mean, I screen captured this because I mean, what, I, what else can conclude out of that? Information properly classified pursuant to an executive order. So an executive order could classify information. Is there, can they have secret executive orders, I wonder? Are they all public? Can we can kind of look back and see if there's some kind of executive order that might pertain to this? Information properly classified pursuant to an executive order. So it seems like to me if a particular thing, executive order, the president could say, no, classify that particular aspect of it, uh, per national security. From Grandy Christopher to Farmer Mitchell T. Result of nucleide analysis. I have these, this one titled Fuel Melting. They're also seeing RU isotope in the seawater and in the air now. And the other, which actually came prior to this one. More results of nucleide analysis are in page 11 to 16. They've detected even LA isotopes indicating fuel melting according to the correlation of group release and fuel temperature. And then the next email says they're also seeing RU isotope in the seawater. Subject, results of nucleide analysis. Now let me quickly go to my, open up my page on, one moment while I get this screen up here. This is ruthenium. And atomic number 44, RU stands for ruthenium. When you look down at the isotopes, it's under Wikipedia. And Wikipedia, if it's like mathematics or physics or something like that, it's very difficult for someone to fudge and, and play with that. I mean, uh, atomic number 44 is going to be 44. Some of these numbers are going to be that. It's when you get into the sketchy, shady areas like the number of deaths from Chernobyl that you don't go to Wikipedia and don't rely on Wikipedia for that at all. If you want to know that 2 plus 2 is 4 or algebraic equations, go to Wikipedia for that. Want to know the deaths related to Chernobyl? Don't go there for that. So this is ruthenium, and I see here where it's a half-life of 373 days. That's one of six ruthenium. ruthenium. One of three ruthenium, half-life of 39 days, and 97 ruthenium, half-life of 2.9 days. Some of these after the meltdown, these these particular elements of isotopes are very short-lasting as they degrade. They don't last, they change in other things. They don't last long. Okay, LA is lanthanum, L-A-N-T-H-A-N-U-M, lanthanum. And basically, it's isotopes, let's see what it says, they're half-life, 138 uh, lanthanum, half-life of 1.05 times 10 to 11 years, a long time, 137 Lanthium, half-life of 60,000 years. And there's numbers that says here, half-life less than one minute. That's what I was looking at here because some of these, and what I, what I read, I believe, in cost and consequences of Chernobyl to the people and environment was that some of these are very short-lived, these strange ones. You don't hear a lot about lanthanum and you don't hear a lot about ruthenium at all or americanium and these kind of things are very short-lived in these criticalities and these incidences. 
again, they're indicative that a criticality has occurred. And that's my understanding anyway. When you see these particular elements around, you say, hey, you know, something's gone down. There's been a criticality that's been released. And all that big flurry of all these different things are immediately released. It's not all iodine. It's not all cesium. They wish it could be, man. And I do, too. I wish it could all be iodine. From Farmer Mitchell T. To a number of uh, nuclearenergy.gov, Miller, Tom, Bill, McCoffey. Results of nuclear analysis. You should probably take a look at this. They're even detecting noble metals around the site, lanthanum and ruthenium, which are indicative of fuel melting. Exactly. I'd ask Dana Powers to have a five-minute look at these, if you could. Richard slash Charlie or slash Sud. We need his opinion. Maybe he can tell from the LA slash RU ratio whether there has been air ingress. If not, I think the ratio should be about what it is in irradiated fuel in general. If so, I'd expect RU to be high as RUOX is quite volatile. Ruthenium oxide is quite volatile. I also don't like the 0.355 MPA pressure reading on Unit 1 yesterday that we talked about. Can't be much water going in as that's about the head the fire pump pushes. It might have stopped pressurizing because the core uncovered, and so there's no more steam production. Or leak rate of containment has matched steam production at pressure. Parentheses. Don't containments usually leak 0.5% a day at pressure? That's what I, I screen captured this for another thing, but one of them right there, just a the fact that he says, parentheses, don't containments usually, usually leak 0.5% per day at pressure? I just, is that true? Is that part of the effluence they're allowed from these plants? Is that why Alec Baldwin's writing about the tooth fairy project and the children's strontium in the children's teeth increases you get closer to the nuclear plant? Could that be part of that? Hmm. Okay, the next one. This is not a drill. Again, this goes back to the very first one from the previous broadcast I did on this section of screen captures where they say it's not a drill. And part of that, a reason for that on these people that are in on the conspiracy is that, hey, it's time to be careful what you say on the phone, on the email, anywhere, anytime, anything. Edit yourself. Those that are on the end know to do it. So the Office of Public Affairs is expecting a large volume of calls from the media and the general public regarding the latest statements from the State Department and the NRC regarding the situation in Japan. All calls from media or the general public on this topic must be referred to this particular number. Direction, control, and flow of information. Very clear what's going on here. The NRC is coordinating its actions with, the, with other federal agencies as part of the U.S. government response to the events in Japan. The NRC is examining all available information as part of the effort to analyze the event and understand its implications both for Japan and the United States. The NRC's headquarters operations center, Bachville, Maryland, has been stood up since the beginning of the emergency in Japan and is operating on a 24-hour basis. NRC incident responders at headquarters have spoken with the agency's counterpart in Japan and offered the assistance of U.S. technical ex experts. NRC representatives with expertise on boiling water nuclear reactors have deployed to Japan as part of a U.S. international agency for an international development team, USED. And again, USED is, wow, very heavily involved in all of this. You said is the federal government agency primarily responsible for providing assistance to countries recovering from disasters. They gotta be in on it, folks. I mean, seriously, if you if you read Disaster Capitalism by Naomi Klein, and you look at what happened when these hurricanes hit South American countries and earthquakes hit these countries, it's so convenient. You said goes in. Who goes in? World Health Organization, International Monetary Fund, they give them bones to give them their crappy Monsanto seed. They're there to help them out. Look at Haiti. People still made a lot of money. It never went there. You know, they say now Haiti's too corrupt to give it to them, right? Look at Katrina. What happened there? You donate a lot of money. Look, if people donate money for these things, where's it going? I think it just goes in their freaking bank account, if you ask me. This next screen capture just shows some of the people involved. Other sources of information. See, they want you to send this out there. This is where you, just look down this list. This is supposed, this is for us. This is our source of information on this disaster. FEMA, which we already know, has been told to stand down. Don't worry, stand down. It's not like we had a three mile of Chernobyl. Any evidence of that, that anything's going to happen here on this one? Stand down, no big deal. 
you said and gives and they give all the the uh, online addresses www.youstead.gov. Department of State's involved. FEMA is listed here. Whitehouse.gov. Nuclear Energy Institute that says the Tooth Fairy Project is bonk. Gosh, man, they must make a lot of money. I'm broke too. I know they make a lot of money. A lot of the American public. Right, and the American Cancer Society they ain't doing nothing to help. The cancer business in America, bigger than ever before. Treatment, every time I see a football game, the college talks about the cancer treatments they're working on. I'm hearing about Rick Simpson oil and a whole bunch of other baking soda and cancers of fungus and all sorts. And goodness knows. I wonder, could they be suppressing information there too? I wonder. International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. That's what I stumbled with one night. I heard so many acronyms. Within 24 hours, my head almost exploded. And I could not say that I had this luck about of it for two minutes on air when I couldn't even say it by. It finally it all caught up to me. That I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Kind of like a frog hopping across the floor in the middle of a broadcast, you know? I'll never forget these things. <laughs> okay, lack of instrumentation. Next one's title. I'm going to try to get through all these tonight. So I'm going to take a day off or maybe two days. I don't know. But I'm not going to talk about the plume gate for going over these and going over these, man, I'm going to probably take a couple days off and not think about them for a while. I hope some other people jump in and start writing about it. Besides the drone picture, this is from F. Peterson, two lines, Peter and John Kelly. It says, besides the drone picture, the other line of evidence I've heard cited by the Japanese is the temperature indication they were reading from their spent fuel pool instrument which recorded temperatures below 100 degrees Celsius. But the photo of Unit 4 on March 16, one day after the explosion, that Steve Fetter sent clearly shows him coming from Unit 4 spent fuel pool. This is only possible if the pool was boiling, and thus the interpretation of the temperature measurement indicating the presence of subcooled water is clearly incorrect. This is confirms, again, what we already know about Unit 4. There's no water in there, man. No, the Japanese are... Again, had it happened over here and, and the wind blew in the other direction of Japan, well, our te version of TEPCO would have come out and lied just as much. Don't even kid yourself to think it would have been any different. Don't say, well, this is oh, Japanese. You just can't trust it. No, it's industry. It's corporations. It's fascism, man. It's super greedy rich families that have been running the show for hundreds of years. That's what it is. That's what it is. Don't blame the Japanese. We would have done the same had the wind blow in the other direction. Had been standing no for no difference, no difference at all. We would have lied to the world, lied to ourselves, lied to the Japanese government. Would have been a hand strung to some degree because of that. Even if they were honest, which they're not, and they're not, and vice versa, they're not. The NRC, eh, mm, DOE, yeah, uh, even worse. But the photo of Unit Four on March 16, one day after the explosion, clearly shows steam coming from the. This is clearly incorrect what Tepco is saying. I've attached the NISA JNES slide on spent fuel pool temperatures from the set that Bob sent. The temperature readings from the Unit 4 pool are much different from Units 5 and 6. This can be expected since Units 5 and 6 had returned their fuel into the reactors and thus had a much larger inventory of water since refueling cavities should have been filled. They also had no large sink for sloshed water to go into presuming sloshing or leakage through a gate seal occurred. Remember, during an earthquake, you spent fuel pools. And they're not all covered. They don't all have baffles. Baffles, like if you think in a carburetor on your uh, fossil fuel combustion engine for the mechanics out there, and I'll try to simplify this for you, you'll have a, uh, a sealed container that's hollow on the inside, very basic fun principle. Inside that, you have your fuel, which would be gasoline. In the event your car is making a corner or stopping or starting at speed and any kind of speed or, or, or slowing down at any kind of rapid rate, that liquid begins to slosh inside of that sealed container. Or if it's an open container like a pool, and if you've seen some of these earthquakes footage, these pools behind people's homes, the water's sloshing right out of it. Well, imagine inside that pool if you put walls, three or four walls, not all the way across, maybe with holes so the water could flow in between. But those baffles is what they're called. Those walls set inside of there keep that water from sloshing out. It'll hit the baffle, and that'll hamper it. It may still slide out, but slosh out, but not to the degree. So that's something to keep in mind, that keeping the water in that containment, in that container, in that pool during an earthquake could be problematic. 
and those of you live in California, I'm in Florida. Earthquakes, yeah, I get some mumbles just bare, just enough to hear the sliding glass door, and it's not from the rock quarry because those are out there in Jonesville. So occasionally I hear a little bit, just enough for me to think it's just the miners. But in California, you know what I'm talking about. And that's, again, why is the people worried about earthquakes and nuclear power plants? Well, you're getting a good lesson on that when you dig for your documents. You really get a good, it's like taking an excellent class. You probably couldn't get this at, at your average college. They wouldn't go into this kind of detail, I doubt, with the plants and all these kind of things that go on on the inside here. Okay, the explosion in the Unit 4 building occurred at 6 a.m. on March 14, 19 hours after the explosion occurred in Unit 3. It's difficult to believe that Unit 3 could have been the source of hydrogen for the explosion in Unit 4, since the Unit 3 explosion likely disrupted any vent path that might have existed between the units. And the Unit 4 explosion occurred long after the Unit 3 explosion. <laughs> Not to belabor the point, the lack of wide-range level instrumentation in these spent fuel pools and building sumps makes the management of these severe accidents much, much harder. The lack of wide-range level instrumentation in these spent fuel pools and building sumps makes the management of these severe accidents much, much harder. We've got some of these contained, Mark 1 containments over here, too, by the way. I mention that every time. Given the massive amount of attention that spent fuel pool safety and security have received since 9-11-01 with the root cause of the potential spent fuel pool accident in Unit 4 to involve the lack of a simple and inexpensive level instrument suggests that our fixation on the risk of high-density racking may have ended up having had the equivalent effects of our fixation on large break uh, loca. That's a, uh, um, oh gosh, I've got, to, I have to look, I've got that written down. Now, look, it's prior to the Three Mile Island accident. So basically, he's calling attention to the fact that they don't have the best instrumentation, and this could be problematic in these events. And again, this is kind of an industry that don't you want, if it's going to be this way, if it's going to be nuclear, don't you want the best of the best, and not these parts I hear about them getting the, uh, non-original um, equipment, they're getting these, what do you call them, the fake, the uh, copy parts or whatever that aren't as good and aren't very reliable. Fortunately, if indeed fuel uncovery occurred in Unit 4 and sufficient fuel damage resulted to generate the hydrogen needed to cause the explosion, it appears the amount of cesium-137 released was relatively small since all of the radioactive materials we've detected at Berkeley and also in Japan have elemental and isotopic compositions consistent with the source being fuel from reactors shut down on March 11 rather than November 29, 2010, when Unit 4 was shut down. Furthermore, the Japanese Self-Defense Forces did not start spraying salt water into the Unit 4 spent fuel pool until March 20, five days after the explosion, which is long enough that essentially complete boil off of water would have occurred in this high-density pool with all of its freshly offloaded them closely packed together. Wow. I mean, they're jammed in there, all these bundles of rods. Five days. We know five days. Complete blow off of water would have occurred. High-density pool. I'm still not able to think of a conclusive way to determine whether the explosion in Unit 4 resulted from hydrogen release from the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. We'll find out eventually when the fuel gets inspected. But I'm curious if there is some clever way to prove what happened, one way or the other, before then. At the bottom it says, early in the event, the Japanese claimed to have a drone or helo picture that showed reflections off the water in Pool 4. I talked about this earlier. Our folks in Tokyo who saw the picture felt it was inconclusive. That may be what they were referring to. And I've seen this, I've seen some of those flyover pictures. It's, it, that's a stretch of the imagination, a long shot to say they saw anything in there. It really is. Tepco's wishful thinking, but again, you don't want panic. And again, you don't want nuclear power. If you don't want panic, you don't want meltdown, just don't have nuclear power. Isn't that a great don't you love in America where they keep treating the symptoms rather than going to the problem? It's like if you have a house or river and you have a dock on the river and you're out there on your boat and the dock, you see pollution, some oily crap floating down. You go out every day and just clean the crap up out of the river and say, that's good enough for me. 
Would you go upstream and find the plant where it's coming from or the source of it and shut it down there? That just makes sense to me. They don't do that around here. Okay, this is the last one for tonight. I'm going to be out of here. I went a little long tonight, but I wanted to complete this one because it wasn't really going to be a full uh, broadcast to do otherwise. And i got someone holding on here. I'll get to you in just a second. Hang on. Wow, I've been on there a long time. I put you on, but hang on just a second. Let me finish reading this. And this I thought was interesting because this in regards to Turkey Point where it shows from previously we had Hurricane Andrew come, Andrew come through and they're talking about the effects of Andrew on Turkey Point, which I thought was interesting after I look at strange weather phenomena at Fort Calhoun, Fort Cooper, and then with Sandy where we see it was intensified and directed. This is very worrisome because this is like how long have these storms maybe been intensified and directed? And I haven't heard of a nuclear plant near Katrina or whatever, but Maybe I need to look into that. Okay, we got a caller. If you're still there and awake, how are you there, just Patrick? Looked, just looked over and saw you there. I just finished up, man. Sorry to make you. I got two computers. I got a laptop off to next of my wife's that I do the blog talk thing on. Then my other uh, one, my Dell computer in front of me. I have my screen captures, and so then I looked over to my left, and I should really have it in front of me. But maybe I'll set it up on my desk one day and really get organized. You know. Yeah, I waited forever for you, but, you know, uh, and then I, are you ready to run? I'm ready, dude. Talk to me. I got time. Uh, first of all, in uh, Reactor 2, they've got a leak, a bad one. Mm -hmm. uh, Reactor 4, the building is decaying. It's about to fill the hole. You know, how long, a year and a half or something? What was the day? Well, it's, yeah, it's, wow, it's been a while since March of 2011, so it's, man, we're going to come up on two years here. We're just, what, three months shy of two years since this thing happened. Well, you know, they haven't improved the situation. They haven't remedied it. If Building 4 collapses down into the ground, I mean, all the reactors are, they knew within three hours they were in full meltdown. Since the catastrophe, nothing has improved. In fact, they're having more and more problems. They're, have, uh, they're chewing a foreign help uh, and lying and covering up uh, what's going on there. If, if Building the collapses in itself, we're about to have an event that's never happened in or in history, you know, and, and, and I, you know, it's real sad, Hattie, is I've come to realize it's the devil. You know, it's evil people that built these radioactive time bombs on fault lines and flood zones uh, that makes poisonous, toxic crap that lasts forever. Who thought of this stuff? You know who thought of it? Evil people. People that their means to the end is the end. They're going to destroy the planet. I mean, hey, you want to hear something? It's like religion. You want to hear something? Sure. Something crazy on the Fukushima that I read the other day. I'll have to get this one up. But one of our, I think it was one of our generals. I can't think of his name. One of our higher level commanders had put forth an idea early on to drill underneath the nuclear plants at Fukushima and then actually put some kind of nuclear bomb or device in there. First, they were going to build up like this berm around the outside in the ocean off the coast. Close in, but they would build this big berm and like a wall. Then they would dig, then they would bore underneath the plant. This was the guy's idea because how bad it was, I guess it was considered, it was taken seriously bore under the plant, detonate that bomb, drop plants down, uh, uh, not, I mean, not far down, but down enough, and then spread seawater into that cavity they were going to make and just flood the whole thing and have like a pond. It, it would have dropped the new plants down into like a big giant pond if you kind of want to think of it that way. It was bizarre when I was reading it. I was like, wow, man, what a crazy idea, too. Yeah, well, it would that would just be some kind of implosion, but... What they, they're actually, they're having a symposium where they're having the NRC is bringing a safety, all kinds of officials, they're, they're coming there, uh, I think like next month or this month, uh, and 
uh, they're looking for ideas. Like one thing they're talking about is injecting concrete underneath. And then another one they're currently working on is a helicopter with some sort of grappling device that will pick up the rods safely. And then they'll put them in temporary transport flasks that they normally use for transporting. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that'll contain them and keep them cool. But it's developing a brand new grappling device from scratch. You know, they, they believe by the way they're shaped that it could grab the toe of it and then basically lift it in the air, and that would expose everybody while that was happening. But that risk might be worth not having the worst catastrophe in the history of the human race. This is going to poison the whole planet. Not only are the humans going to die, but all the all the animals. Hey, I thought it was interesting. It's going to make the ocean red, like that movie. They talk about number four in this one document, and they talk about the spent fuel and the bundles, and then they say they do this uh, this modeling or whatever, and they get this ultra low dose. It's below the EPA standards over here. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense because everything else I've been hearing outside of the document is like if spent fuel pool four collapses and goes down, it would be, you know, catastrophic to say the least. So that particular one model that they said was so, I went off on that one. I was like, that is so ridiculous. It's ridiculous, man. It's just absolutely hey, you know, ridiculous. You know, the uh, the particle weapon or the device that was used on the Twin Towers, Mm -hmm. It may have the ability to make concrete and steel lose its uh, molecular bonds. Maybe that beam could be shot at the reactors and de-radioactivize the isotopes by making them come apart. I'm sure yeah. quite easily, man. I'm sure. Hey, where, what happened to Pete Santilli? Uh, as far as what? His YouTube channel shut off. Oh, well, shut down? You never check your emails or nothing. You don't check if you have callers. You don't check your messages. I, on, I never said I was. I never said I was a pro, man. I'm an amateur. Oh, I'm talking. No, but I think oh, I was. was <laughs> uh, look, he told me that the Pentagon child porn DMV thing that it, they they removed that video from his channel. He told me that. Yeah, but his channel's closed down completely. Well, oh, I see. I got three. I've been on the air, man. I checked my stuff uh, earlier today. Okay, I see. I got a couple of things. Huh? No shit, dude. Dude, I'm tough. Look, I, let me just say this. People don't really understand what's happened recently. They really don't fully comprehend yet who we put. Well, hey, fill a banner out. Go ahead. Long. Come on, what? Well, I mean, obviously there's a huge giant network of agents, and we got close enough to reveal enough that they got, I would say they could, anything that's electronic or made from software or computer from Dell or from any GE or your TV, they own all that shit. They control all of it. They can read all your email, read all your, they can turn something on, turn something off, add likes, remove likes, open your channel up, shut your channel down. The control if they could shut me down, any they could shut us conversation right now. If they really wanted, I'm sure they're listening in. They always do. They always do, don't they? His channel is gone. Wow. Yeah. So what's the what, what's the dirty on Pete Santilli? I You know, one thing was Pete Santilli. Oh, you're right, though. Your you're analysis right in the army. Or the yeah, you're right on your analysis. I, I don't deny it because I'm at, like at the point now where I'm very careful what I say publicly. You know, if I'm on the air or if I do a video, you don't know how many videos that don't go up because I, you know, I'll get mad and I'll just run off of the mouth. And, you know, it's not good. So I'm very careful what I edit and what I, and I'm very careful my one uh, advice for people getting into online activism. My thing, I say very clearly, you know, violent or damaging property or something, you just can't even ever, they'll use that as a weapon against you when you use that kind of language. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even understand what really, of course, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek as a broadcaster's going along, and there's a big difference between that and some guy showing you a video how to freaking shoot drones down, you know, and the other guy saying that, just like JFK, I don't think he said anything JFK didn't say when peaceful revolution isn't, 
no longer possible, then violent revolution is inevitable or something like that. Isn't that what he said? No, you're not following the, uh, the, the, the story close enough. Uh, actually, I guess Pete may have made a reference that to burn down the um, Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. And then he was getting threatened about something about that. But, yeah, you know, well, I've got an article about his gun on the show. That's not good either. That's not good leadership. He shouldn't be doing that. It hurts his credibility. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know well, what? I, I, if he's gone forever, then I totally called it. I said that exactly, that I wanted to help prevent, help him to not look stupid and not get himself mm -hmm. in trouble. I mean, there's a lot to it, man. You can't, you, can't, you know, I, he wasted his courage by because he wasn't guarded enough. I, I'm in for my a channel to get shut off now. Sucks. I put a lot of work into it. Wow. But, and, you know, people that watch the show don't appreciate the risk we're taking from these truth shows. Don't give a shit. They're just bitch about the spell in there. Yeah, I went off and said that. Some of the people that are having fun because all this drama and whatever right now, it's, it's, it's pretty damn serious. It's not about drama or whatever. They, those people that are watching it, for the, they're following us around because of the drama, what's going on. That's bullshit, man. I'm don't, not, you see how, don't you see how, how Pete Gentile, by not playing this close to the vest, has hurt himself? And he's really hurt the truth movement because this is a huge distraction. Oh, I agree and now. I was thinking really today, just when you said it's a giant distraction, now that he's talking to trees and stuff. Now, now i got to wonder, you know. You're, you know uh, it is a distraction. I can't give no, you a I don't wonder oh, about it. I mean, I prefer to be gullible and think that what he was saying was true because I'd like to have a hero. I, 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 I'm not opposed to him. I, he's the only show that I like to. I mean, he's like the current Phil Donahue for me. I, that's my talk show. I'll tuning into Pete Santilli, he's always interesting. And his courage is, is what gets everybody. And the fact that he says his name like 50 times <laughs> during the show. <laughs> but <laughs> he's full of himself. That's okay. We need You need a pup that can stand up for himself and, and you need somebody that... Yeah, at the same uh, time, man, others need to start doing the same freaking thing because I don't like one guy being a figurehead to any degree. We need, instead of one, why not like a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand? Why don't freaking everybody start getting involved like Pete Santilli? Why don't everybody start speaking out? Just a little bit. You don't have to be that much in the camera's eye and, and to that level, but I think there's a, so many people in America, as you well know, the sheeple, they, they're not doing anything productive to help at all. And they're just doing their Yeah, I know the truckers out there, every trucker, if you guys would get together, you could shut down the country in one second. Truckers, oh, you know. And then law enforcement, law enforcement, law enforcement. You guys, you have no. families. You know, stop worrying about drones. You realize that the people of trucks are not following the Constitution, and you have a constitutional obligation Try to pull our country back from the abyss, you stupid sons of bitches. They're all worried about tasering a couple of white bread people who came in a car seat instead of going down to Washington and doing what you're supposed to do. Part of the New World Order. I, I, we got to have police. We have to have a blue line. We have to have order in our society. We want it to be safe. The citizens want to support you. We are not the battleground. We are not the enemy. The citizens are not the enemy. Mm. And where is law enforcement? Come on, you guys got plenty to go with. You know, I saw some videos where internationally they're putting together a 9-11 uh, trial. Mm. Where is law enforcement? Where is the new, you know, uh, man, God, if anybody knows the Donald, you tell the Donald, you give me that five million dollars for Obama, we'll get some attorneys and get them going. Why is Donald give an attorney? We're attorney talk to the government. Where is we need that? We need the very checks the tiny. But for the first time I actually support the ACLU, man. 
Where are the tongues? Where are the people who talk to the adults that aren't part of this madness? Well, what madness? Uh, drive us off the cliff and kill us all? Yeah, I'm wondering, are, are we on a lower level, are they even talking about stuff? Are they amongst themselves even... Do they even have the same concern? They're all everyone's getting sprayed with the chemtrails right now, and the radiations don't select between white or black or man or woman. So that's, I feel the same. And I reach out to them. I'm not going to adopt that position of the some of these alternative sites. All they play is cop brutality crap all the time, man. It's not every cop is not. You can't take one bad example and apply it across the board. But I can same respect. I'm saying why aren't they standing up right now and some kind of resistance or speaking out or, you know, something from them. I'm dreaming I would like to see mass arrest, you know, but I, I guess that's probably just wishful thinking, huh? Hey, where's all the U.S. Marshals? Why aren't the U.S. Marshals going over into Congress and, and arresting some of these guys that we know? Why aren't they launching a new investigation? The population, nope, they're just going to roll over, you know... You guys have families, man. I guess you're going to live in the bunker. It's a trip, yeah, To man. some degree, there's a whole lot of programming and indoctrination, man. I mean, I I don't know what it's like. I've never been in law enforcement myself. But that's the job they took and swore the oath. If they just upheld the oath they took and started protecting the Constitution as you read it the first time through, not with 10,000 lawyers to look at a sentence for a year until you mean something totally different. The way you read it through the first time, that's what it means, man. We just need to enforce that, and to some degree, we can get order back. I still think we need to, considering technology and stuff, we might need to add some dang amendments in there or something, man, because I'm worried about artificial life forms and nanobots. And I don't want none of that, to be honest with you. Well, it's like I wish the police understood that there are a lot of people like me where I would say, if I was driving down a highway and I started driving by a stop and there was a cop car with his lights on and then there was some car pulled over and as I started to drive by, I looked over and I saw a civilian, a regular dude, pounding on a cop, like say the cop was on his knees and the dude was blailing him, I would stop the car and jump out and beat the freaking crap out of that dude. No, actually, there's a law. You're supposed to have to go and render assistance I would like that. Crap. They would, I wouldn't survive, man. I would have every right to, to, to help a policeman and kill that guy. That's sick, man. I need policemen to protect my wife when I'm not home. I need policemen to keep the idiots from driving like assholes down these little highways. We need the police. They're not the bad guys. No, nope, that's exactly not right. The bad people. Not the bad people. I can't say that enough. You know, I have 90 seconds. Them. They'll have you thinking yeah. they're the bad guys, though, if you let their propaganda get to you. We, like you're saying, I'm going to reach out and try to talk to them and give them some information and connect to them on the best level I can, man. I just say God bless America, man. That's, that's all I care about is our country. That's all I really care about. Right. I just want our country to be safe. I'm going to look into this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check my other email on my Yahoo account to see if Pete's written me anything yet about this. I'll send you an email on if I get any information and find out what happened. All right, I'll, 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 I'll probably be posting this. So this is Rocket from the Rocket Radio. See you later, buddy. All right, Rocket, over now. And for everybody, I'm heading out for the night, so everybody take care. Over.